interesting that as long ago as, I think, 1926, Cardinal O'Donnell um, made a speech in the course of which he said that the boundaries of Northern Ireland were fixed and they were not going to change. And therefore, it was the duty of Catholics to engage with the state as it was. Um, and again, it's a, it's a most extraordinary thing for him to say, uh, since, in fact, uh, his successor, Cardinal McCrory, gave much of his life trying to have the border abolished. Um, and by and large, I think it is, it is the case that um, the church supported the structures of the state in Northern Ireland as they were. After all, institutional Catholicism did benefit uh, from you know, the Protestant state, um, though perhaps not as generously as it might have done, but the government did fund Catholic schools, 50% um, up until the 1940s, and then 75% thereafter, and now, of course, 100%. Um, although it didn't have, the state didn't have very much control over the schools. So that, in other words, you had a situation whereby um, the, the Protestant state, the Unionist state, was subsidizing Catholic education. Um, and as I say, it exercised a rather sort of, I suppose, benevolent you know, oversight. Um, and at a particular point, um, since we're in St. Mary's College, I mean, it, it did fund this college. Uh, and then it paid, this was only for girls, as, 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 as you may remember. And then it did fund uh, male teachers to go to England to be trained. And then at a particular point when the church decided it would quite like its own male teacher training college uh, in the north of Ireland, again, this was financed and, and paid for by the state. So that, um, although there, there were occasions, of course, when uh, the church thought that the Catholic community is getting a raw deal, and, and indeed it did in, in, in many respects, one cannot um, underestimate uh, the benefits to institutional Catholicism. And therefore, uh, from its position in the north of Ireland, and therefore the temptation, if you like, or the disposition uh, of, of churchmen to analyze uh, the situation from the point of view of government. Um, and again, this is a, a thing that one sees throughout Irish history, certainly in the, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Yes. I think that there's um, the um, relationship, is a very strange relationship. I think there's a model that you can take that if in any situation like ours, you have um, a kind of peaceful living as between one institution and another, then that will be allowed to go on and anything that disturbs that relationship will be frowned upon, even if it's, even if it comes from, say, Catholics or people who w would from, be from a Catholic tradition. Uh, the other thing is that if, however, the state is doing something which is against what is seen to be Catholic interests, as defined by the institution, then there's a struggle for power or a struggle for control. And I think a lot of things can be understood, perhaps, if we take the model of a struggle for power. And the struggle for power and control has been going on for far be it for me to, to say what the history of the thing is. But the, in, in the city of Belfast, the struggle for power between people in Catholic authority and people who were in people's authority, if you like, that's been going on all the time, and sometimes it was a very bitter struggle. I mean, look look at the, the beginnings of your various organizations and newspapers and things like that. So the, the, you get different, different models, but depending on what's happening then, the church then quite basically, I mean, we were taught that uh, we had an obligation to obey lawful government or even existing government, mm -hmm. even if it was perhaps an unfair government, even indeed if it was an unjust government, we were bound then for the sake of peace, harmony and stability and uh, to avoid possible loss of life, etc. That, we were, that, that was our obligation to support the existing government, even if the existing government had been brought about by force or by whatever means. As long as it was there, then in the absence of anything better, that was your obligation. And I remember when I was young, uh, there was a, a, there were a number of elections, of course, but there was one particular election that I remember very well. 
that uh, I think it involved Crummock. Uh, and uh, there was a, somebody there who was, uh, he would have been described as a Republican socialist, I think. And uh, we, we were told very, very clearly, although we were children didn't have a vote, but I remember hearing it, that um, our obligation in conscience was to vote for the unionists because the unions, that would mean that there was a certain stability and certain uh, things could be gained for, for people, etc. But with the Republican Socialists, you never knew what would happen. That was the thinking. And, um, and, and so, but it was based upon the idea that stable government was, or existing government, it was to be obeyed by uh, the, the people unless you could clearly demonstrate that an alternative was available. So the relationship then, that there has been a struggle for power, and I think it's a more crude thing than, than that. I mean, uh, that it's not based so much on principle. It's, uh, it's based on the idea that we should control. And I think that, that must explain an awful lot of what was happening in the conflicts with uh, Joe Devlin and the hierarchy and all these things. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a question uh, I come back to a very crude idea which I think is, is so crude that I hesitate to say it but I, I think it has to be thought about and that is the idea that in any society the decisions that are made are of secondary importance first importance is who makes them so therefore you find that there can be quite a, quite a conflict of interest, even when you get two parties or two sections of the people wanting much the same thing. Because the important thing f is, for, for many people, is not the decision that will be made, but who will make it. And, and I think that explains an awful lot about our politics too, that, that you find uh, people in opposition, they, they, they go out of opposition to the government and do exactly the same thing that the last lot did. Because the important thing is not the decision, but who makes it. And I think we've got to think about that, and I think we've got to cure that as well. And start living, working, believing, hoping, treating people as a matter of principle in which we really believe. Just the, the logic here uh, is, is that, that the church is going to support the government, right, right me or wrongly. And yet I know Father Rafferty, uh, from reading your work, that in actual fact, the state didn't trust the church, um, that they, they were very, very suspicious of it. And you've even suggested uh, to the extent that the church was actually undermined in winning the allegiance of Catholics in Northern Ireland. Well, it comes to distrust the church because um, once we have things like internment and Bloody Sunday, uh, the sorts of complaints that bishops are making seem to echo the sorts of complaints of members of the IRA. Um, so from the point of view of the, of the British government, at one point uh, in the Troubles, it looked as if you know, the IRA and institutional Catholicism were singing from the, the same, as it were, hymn sheet. Um, and it was precisely because, uh, in a certain sense, the church had so little influence over government policy that people turned to the radicals, to the IRA, to Sinn Féin, who at least had uh, an agenda and who seemed, for reasons of violence and so on, to be making some impact uh, on the British government, causing the British government you know, to begin to, uh, to think in a different way, uh, in a manner in which institutional Catholicism um, couldn't bring that about. Yeah. Didn't the Foreign Office even um, appeal to the Vatican? to actually intervene over here and... Well, um, there were quite a number of representations, uh, partly through uh, the papal nuncio in, in London, who, strictly speaking, had no jurisdiction in Ireland, but he wrote to the British government at one stage saying that he would like to represent the British government's uh, view of what's happening in the north of Ireland at the Vatican, as opposed to his opposite number in Dublin, who was giving um, a, a only one particular line as were Archbishop Wallabrandi, uh, of whom it is said uh, that the IRA said he is the only bishop in Ireland who understands us. Um, so he gave a, a very, a very Republican, a very kind of hardline view of the situation uh, in in Ireland at the time. Um, his opposite number in Dublin, um, 
trying to, in a certain sense, cozy up to the British government, uh, offers this 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 um, role to relate to the Vatican, um, uh, the British government's view. And it's true that you get from time to time, for example, um, Pope Paul VI uh, caused the Secretary of State, Cardinal Vio, uh, to write a letter of protest to the British government, largely through the intervention of Cardinal Conway. Conway was convinced that from the the outbreak of the serious troubles, that there were two campaigns of violence um, in the north of Ireland, one by the IRA and the other the assassination of ordinary Catholics. And this is something that he, that he kept very, very um, strict notes about this, the, the number of Catholics who were assassinated and so on and so forth. And he regularly fed this to the Vatican, so much so that, as I said, at one point, um, the Paul VI caused Cardinal Veal to write to Harold Wilson, uh, the then Prime Minister in Britain, on this very point, this campaign of assassination that um, the Vatican thought the British government was doing nothing about, nothing to prevent. And But it's interesting how, how the thing was phrased, um, because Cardinal Veal wrote to Wilson saying that the Vatican was quite sure that the British government was doing all it could to prevent sectarian assassinations. This had to be interpreted by the Foreign Office for Wilson. Um, and the Foreign Office said, when the Vatican says it's convinced it's doing, that the British government is doing all it can to prevent assassinations, it means it's convinced the British government is not doing uh, all it can to prevent assassinations. So these were the dynamics, uh, as it were, um, in, terms of, um, in terms of the Vatican, in terms of the relationship between uh, church and state at that time. Complicated, of course, because of the activities of um, Catholics in England. Um, Quite often, for example, um, you would have various government uh, ministers trying to get Catholic MPs to put pressure on uh, bishops in England to take a firmer line with their, their counterparts in Ireland over the activities of the IRA. Yeah. So there's, there's all sorts of dimensions to this. Uh, the, the, you know, the bottom line is, Father, Father Wilson, you're an ordinary priest on the ground dealing with all of this. Why is this? Is this something to do with why you actually end up leaving? That you you just feel that you can't achieve anything working within the institutional church? Well, I, I think you, you have to come to yeah, you have to come to a conclusion. That you, that there's something you should, you think people should be able to do. You explore the ways in which they can do it. If you find that those ways have failed, you must try something else. And it, you fight every inch of the way to. to uh, not to believe that whatever institution or group or party you belong to is unable to do the job. That, that's very hard to take that. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, you fight every inch of the way for that. But when eventually you have to decide, no, you have to try, try a new method, well then, well then you go about it. Now, what, one, of the, one of the, there were a number of reasons why, um, I mean, people would say, well, stay there and keep knocking at the doors because the, from the gospel you hear about knocking at the door all the time with the unjust judges and all that sort of thing which, which I suppose maybe that's what one should do but if you say well let somebody else do that I want to do this other thing the, the other thing was that the, when Oliver's talking about there the representations being made to, um, to, to Rome uh, one of the incidents that happened to us that uh, on, on a journey to Rome, uh, there's, there's people from Ballymurphy and White Rock uh, decided to go, go on, a, on a visit to Rome. Uh, and so that, that's the fact that we did. They, they in, in the afternoon, went to have tea with Countess somebody or other, which was arranged by Lydia Doolan very kindly. I, however, foolishly, decided that I would use the opportunity to visit the ambassador to the Vatican, the Irish ambassador to the Vatican. And I'm sorry I didn't go to tea, because there was nothing there. Uh, it was somebody professing to know nothing about the situation, said, said, no suggestion, nothing. So much so that on the way out, uh, what the secretary said to me, don't be too hard on him. And I said, I'm just not going to say anything about him. Not for a long time. Mm. But however, our situation then turned out to be that um, the, the papal representative in, in England um, did not consider that the north of Ireland was any part of his business. 
I mean, to take care of, certainly, mm. maybe maybe to make comments, but certainly not. The people known to you in Dublin, Monsignor uh, 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 Ali oh, Brandy, Brandy, he was, it was made very clear to him that he should not go any further north than Dundalk. Now, I know that because he told me. And he also told a very close friend of mine that the Catholic Church in, in Ireland was very conservative and that if she wanted to do any work of a creative kind, she'd be better to go to England. So here we were in the northeast of Ireland with no official representation bringing us directly in line with the Pope. And we must have been among the only people in Europe. And that was at a time when we were suffering mightily. Now, is it any wonder people, people are angry? Now, what, what do you do about that? What you do is you try to see if there's any other way. And people then do say there's, there's another way. You try to bring influence to bear on uh, clergy, on, on bishops abroad. And that happened, that influence was brought to bear on, on uh, bishops in Italy, France, United States, Canada, Norway. So you, you have to fight. you have your eye on the ball. You, you, know, you know what you want. And you say, are we capable in our present structures of doing it? And if we're not, then we think about, we think about something else. I think I think our panel have talked enough. Are there any anybody would like to ask any questions or make any comments? Oh yes, we do have someone. If we can, could you please state your name first, yep. and then the, the, uh, wherever, somebody over here. Right, if you could do the same, state your name afterwards. We will take a couple of questions. Yeah, Pascal McCullough. Um, the question follows on from the last part of the, the discussion now about the Vatican. And it's about the present incumbent, um, Pope Francis, and whether you see any impact or what impact do you see of, of all the things you've been talking about in the current uh, thinking that's really coming out of the Vatican? And we had a question here as well. It was um, about the Pope's visit to Ireland when he came. Do you think now, looking back at everything that happened, that he came to try and stop a revolution, to stop people going towards Sinn Féin and provisionals because we had nothing else, nobody else to go to, and I'm now just listening to the debate thinking that it was a cynical move. Okay, I can say something to that. Um, I'm not sure how cynical it was. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's absolutely clear uh, from the speeches that he made that he was determined to oppose the IRA and in particular his Drogheda speech, you know, telling them to stop and, and begging you know, on my knees. Uh, but then going further and say, says things like, um, I too want justice, but violence uh, delays the day of justice. Um, it wasn't the first time, of course, that, um, and I'm, I, I'm not privy to the circumstances in which the Irish hierarchy decided to, to invite the Pope. But it's certainly not the first occasion in which um, appeal had been made specifically to the papacy about Irish political affairs. Um, one has it a, a number of times uh, in the 19th century and indeed even in the 20th century. Um, it is said that um, um, Count George Plunkett, uh, the father of Joseph Mary Plunkett, who was um, executed in 1916, that he went to see Pope Benedict XV in the run-up to the Rising uh, to ask the Pope to bless the Rising. Now, it is certainly true he went to Rome and he had an interview with the Pope and he gave the Pope an aid memoir um, filled with lies, frankly, uh, about the circumstances of his going there. But he doesn't ask the Pope directly for a blessing. But nevertheless, he comes back to Dublin um, a, f uh, a day or two before the Rising and tells everybody whom he could meet that the Pope has blessed the Rising. And so this is, you know, as you might imagine, a very important thing for those who are taking part and, and so on and so forth. But again, uh, you have attempts um, similarly by the British government during the, the early troubles, you know, kind of 1919 to, to 21, uh, to get the Pope to intervene directly, um, to put pressure on the Irish bishops, who would then put pressure on the insurgents to stop. And um, in fact, in, in, during the course of the Civil War, uh, the Pope actually sent a special representative um, to Ireland uh, to try to get the, the irreconcilables 
to give up and, and so on and so forth. He was sent back in after a few weeks. Uh, the Irish government uh, decided they, that his presence was uh, doing more harm than good. Um, so it, it is true that you have attempts um, by either the nationalists on the one hand or the British government on the other to appeal to the papacy on the basis that, you know, as we were talking about earlier, the people will obey the pope. But of course, as we know, this, this, this is simply, um, at, w at one level, kind of wishful thinking. Um, and people, in the end, will make up their own you know, minds of, so far as, 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 as politics is concerned. But this does touch on, on a question or an issue that, that Des raised, and it is this. Too often, uh, when we think about the church, we think about the institution. You know, in other words, bishops, pope, priests, and so on. Um, but we know that the church is Ordinary people, the lay people. After all, this is uh, Cardinal Newman's uh, f favorite, uh, famous saying. When asked about the laity in the church, he said, uh, "The church would look odd without them." Um, <laughs> and and so it, it is the business then. Um, and Des touched on this a little bit, of in the environment and, and culture in which we live, people deciding things for themselves, you know, and not necessarily listening to authoritative pronouncements uh, by the church. And then that has something to say about how we do theology and how we come to decision making in the church. Mm -hmm. um, because if, it's, if we take the idea of the census, as we're fidelity of the sense of the faithful, ordinary people have a sense of what it means to be a Catholic and what the Catholic faith is. Uh, but too often, um, that doesn't necessarily tally with what bishops and priests think. Um, ought to happen or ought to obtain. Um, and, and that is a real difficulty. If it is true, as, as Dea says, you know, that the Holy Spirit is given to everyone, uh, then everyone must have some sort of sense of how the church functions and how it operates. But if we let people you know, do this, uh, it's going to be an entirely different church, isn't it? You know? And that's not something that uh, our hierarchical, hierarchical kind of leaders want. Well, the <clears throat> one of the results of um, institutions behaving so oppressively so often is the word, the very word institution itself takes on a negative resonance. Mm -hmm. you know. um, institutionalization. You know. I mean, institution comes to mean something which is arthritic and stiff and fixed and so on. Um, whereas, in fact, <coughs> I think we should resist that. <coughs> um, you know, d d democracy is an institution. Yes, uh, a peace group is an institution. Even the anthropologists would say a handshake is an institution. Kinship is a, um, one of the positive sides of the church's sense of institutionality. Is that there, it refuses the liberal individualist mistake that human life isn't institutional. Um, one of the gains, I think, of the Catholic tradition there, as opposed, say, to a certain radical Protestantism, is that Catholics tend to understand institutionality, that because human life is communal life, because we're not isolated, then institutions sh are or should be what actually brings us together. The fact that they much more often wedge us apart then gets institutions a bad name. Yeah? But I don't. But, but the danger with that is we're then going to fall into a kind of polarity in which there are institutions over there, and something called you know rebellion or individuals or anarchy or persons over here. You can't be a person without being brought up within certain social institutional forms. Person is a relational context uh, notion and. Well, who says relations says institution in some way. It is. Sorry. Yeah, it is. Going back to the, the first question, does it not? Well, that's what I was going oh, to thank say. You. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yes, to be yeah. yes. It's actually, yeah, the, about, about the, the present pope, that was what. Yes, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. th th this is great. I think people gave a great sigh of relief and they said, this is great. They, they, then the, the, that has to follow on with well, what's the effect. You know perfectly well that in a number of years we know perfectly well that another person could be selected who would act quite differently. Therefore, the big question is, does the present Pope succeed in creating or helping to create a 
structure or a custom or a law or something which will be permanent no matter what the next person does. And if the answer to that is yes, well then you're in business, this is good. If the answer is no, that you're, you're entirely concerned with the charisma of the present Pope, what mm. shoes he mm. wears or what he <laughs> yeah. does, where he takes his breakfast and all that, then I'm afraid we haven't really maybe progressed yeah. as much as we would like to progress. The, the other thing is, is that about the, the, the visit in 79, mm -hmm. um, on that occasion, the, the, the curious thing was that there was a great swelling of public opinion asking for the Pope to visit this part of Ireland. And um, it went so far that, that uh, people said, in the loyalist tradition, they said, can we have, uh, can we have uh, an interview with the Cardinal, the Cardinal of Faith? And the answer, of course, yes. He'll talk to anybody who wants to talk to him. And so the, the meeting was arranged. And that meeting was for these representatives of loyalist group, one of one of whom was very tough, I can tell you, um, was to ask Cardinal Fee to use his influence to get the Pope to go to the north of Ireland. And their argument was, first of all, he would be treated with respect and that the various organisations and so on would, would guarantee that, or at least make that declaration. And secondly, that all he'd have to do would be to come through a corridor from over the far side of the border up to Armagh. And that, and of course, philosophy, naturally enough, he said he would do what he could. But as a matter of fact, um, it, it didn't happen. And various reasons were given. One of the reasons was about Mountbatten. Uh, but some of us also had the idea that perhaps there might be a diplomatic problem here which would be soluble namely that if the Pope were to make a visit to this area uh, in the context of a visit to Britain that might be looked upon as a political statement that this area was part of Britain this is a political statement if however he made it in the context of a visit to the other part of Ireland then another political statement might be construed in that I think that that would have been a piece of diplomacy which could be very easily taken care of. And the, the, to this day, we, 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 still, we still really don't know what the dynamics of the thing were. But the other thing was that, that wasn't that the Pope who waved his finger at... at That's right, at the liberation I, so Well, the, these were terrible mistakes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there, there was a whole, a whole um, <coughs> campaign against communism and against liberation theology and w w at the same time you, you'd feel sure that a much better policy on our part would be to have people around the table and talk and listen and understand and say the formula would be not condemnation but I know what you're doing I appreciate your reason for doing it but I think there's a better way let's talk about that I, I think that that would be the, the perfect, uh, well, not only a Christian response, because one of the things we also had to recognize in the light of liberation theology, or the light of any kind of theology, was that we recognized the divine quality in what everybody <coughs> was doing and saying. Because after all, people who were, according to our belief, were, were created and redeemed divinely. They, they have a dignity which cannot be taken away from them. And therefore, people um, have a right to be listened to and respected. So uh, no, uh, with those principles, I think a lot of problems and a lot of difficulties could have, been, could have been solved. But we don't solve them by having massive crusades against capitalism, communism, or terrorism. <laughs> you, you don't do it. They don't politically if people want to, but theologically, I, I just see, can't see how it's justified. Can I ask one question? If that's the case, then how would you change the current church today if it needs change? I think that we need changes, uh, uh, certainly. But I, I, I believe that the changes, 
I hate talking about top and bottom, but if you do recognize the top and the bottom concept or model, change comes from the bottom. And the most dramatic way I can think of saying it is that when, when Jesus Christ was preaching his message, where did he go? He went to what used to be called in the sermons the multitudes. That's us. He went to the masses, as some of our communist friends would say. He went to the people, or the people of God. Put it whatever way you like. But it was the people sitting on the shore, and the people up the mountain, and the people in the streets, as well as the people in the synagogue and whatever. If you want the message of Christ, if that's what Christians want, my suggestion is that you go to the multitudes to find it. Because that's where it was given in the first place. The, um, can I, if I, I just make a quick comment about the phrase liberation theology. Um, it seems to me, in a way, it's a misleading phrase because I think all authentic theology is liberation theology. I don't think there's a special branch or arm or department of theology, particularly belonging in Latin America, which is liberation theology. The, the, the gospel understood is about liberation. On the point, however, that you raise, uh, uh, how can we change, will the church change? I guess I'm pretty pessimistic for this reason. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty pessimistic definition anyway. Um, not for me, not only is the glass always half empty, but it's almost certainly full of some lethal, <laughs> noxious <laughs> you know, you liquid. That I, yeah. um, but I think there are realistic grounds for being pessimistic, with, namely this. Um, the last big attempt to change the church, the structures of the church, radically was Vatican II, right? And certainly one of the reasons why the Catholic left failed was because those changes were steadily steamrolled and rolled back in so many quarters, yeah. Or they were token changes which didn't make all that much difference in the end, right? Now, the changes within the church, that campaign was locked into a much wider political campaign. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Vatican II was going on at the same time as the civil rights movement, at the same time as the anti-Vietnam movement, the same time as student insurgency. In an extraordinary period of left militancy, uh, which we haven't witnessed since. Um, by the, somebody once said, uh, the 60s ended in 1973. The 60s ended with the oil crisis yeah? and the tightening of global capitalism, the increasing rolling back of working class movements, aggressiveness towards the left, Thatcher, Reagan, and so on. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this. You can't look at change in the church in isolation. You know, change in the church depends upon a broader political context. That's one of the points that Slant was trying to make. Don't just think about intra-ecclesiastical reform. That must be seen in a broader context. And if the broader context is going with you, if, you're, if the left in general is on the up, then gains can be made, and some gains were made uh, in, in the church at that point. But um, the failure to reform the church since is part of a much broader defeat of the left in the faces of structures which have proved enormously resilient and obdurate. In one sense, in what, although that's bad news, it's also not very surprising news. You know, I mean, who, whoever, whoever thought it was going to be easy, <coughs> I mean, the, the, I mean, the fact basically is that they've got more tanks than we have. You know? I mean, the situation is always loaded against the left. That's why the left is the left, and the system is the system. It's not some kind of symmetrical who's going to win this time game. Yeah? But the fact is that the left has, because of the tightening of global capitalism over that period, um, the left and the working class movement has suffered grievous rebuffs the um, tradition of revolutionary nationalism came to an end really in the early 1970s. Various ugly uh, neoconservative or neo-fascist um, ideologies then began to crawl out from under various stones. And the immobility of the church, its obdurate resistance to change, or its kind of buying off cosmetic kinds of change, I think has to be seen in that broader context. Mm -hmm. Um, 
if we want to change the church, we're going to have to change things more generally. And we're going to have to, have to change ourselves. It has to begin with us. And, and also, it seems to me that perhaps it's wrong to think that uh, a single pope can affect so much change in the church. Obviously, in the history of the papacy, there have been outstanding characters. But perhaps it is wrong to think that uh, any given pope can make that much difference that we will begin to look at the church in a wholly new yeah. way. Yeah. And don't forget the, the, the factors um, surrounding the papacy, which, as we're militate against change, it's often said that the role of the Roman Curia is to protect um, the papacy from the pope, um, so that the institution is the important thing. Uh, and all of the kind of structures in Rome have that uh, as, a, as its aim. And how much room for, for maneuver the Pope has, any individual Pope has, given the kind of um, uh, the curia, given how it works, um, it's, it's, it's not... It's a phrase, yes. I was, didn't know, the, the Pope is prisoner of the Vatican. Yes, yes, exactly. Which meant literally, yes, exactly. Yes. But all Popes are prisoners of the Vatican. Mm. You know, and it's part of, it must be part of our analysis, mm. not, as you say, like, not to hinge too much on individual agency, however impressive mm. particular individuals may That's be. Right, they're, they're surrounded by... Uh, Cardinal Sir Humphrey Appleby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Big time. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. 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 On, on that note, um, can I can I ask you all to put your hands together for our conversation? <laughs>